Okay, so um, uh, as I said before, we are trying to give you the main ideas of what we are doing. And um, uh, as uh, Tobias has already mentioned, we are uh, working between fundamental theory development and applications. And the things we try to develop and the, the applications we are working on are linked to what we call theoretical spectroscopy, meaning electronic excitations, uh, spectroscopy like optical spectroscopy, photo emission, and so on. And we're trying to do this using ab initio calculations. And uh, much of this is linked to interaction between electrons, and this is why correlation is in the title. And uh, we very much believe in the power of collaboration, and this is why we also have collaboration in the title. And as you will see, it's very much about combining uh, strengths of different methods and uh, bringing different approaches together, and in particular between models and uh, ab initio calculations. And the people who have mainly contributed to the things you will see today are uh, two PhD students, Ayub Arina and Marco Ranzini, uh, postdocs, uh, who are Martin Panholzer and Jakob Koskilo, and Mohamed Gunes, who is online and who is a master student. Um, so I will start by giving you an introduction of what it means to work with functionals. And as I said, please interrupt me if something is not clear or if you would like to know more. And functionals is actually a difficult topic. And this is why I have a subtitle here, which is uh, how to work with the unknown, because usually we have no clue of how these functionals look like. Sometimes they don't even exist. And certainly it's very uh, difficult. And the way to overcome this problem is what we call the connector approach. And uh, we'll introduce this. And you will see that in order to make the connector approach work, we have to have a lot of knowledge from models. And uh, so we also have to work on models. And here, Matteo will interrupt me and we'll talk about a very particular model, which is the homogeneous electron gas. And then finally, if time permits, we will also show you what we can really do with this. So let's start with the functionals. So what we do, as I said, is to uh, look at things that are linked to electronic excitations, or in particular, or more in general, we are looking at observables, of course, things that we can measure. And these observables are determined by quantum mechanics, meaning that uh, they depend on the wave function, the many body wave function of our uh, system, of our material. And um, to calculate observables when you knew, know the wave functions, and in particular the ground state wave function for a ground state observable, it's actually very simple. It's just the expectation value. So this is a well-known expression. It's just an integral. And the only thing is that it's very difficult to use. We cannot use it in general, uh, at least exactly, for more than a very few electrons because the many body wave function is a, a huge object and it's uh, almost impossible to calculate in many cases and certainly impossible to store. So now you have different ways to go. And for example, at Casus, you would uh, uh, often do uh, quantum Monte Carlo or other approaches where you try to approximate the wave function. Here we will talk about another route, which is to say, this is an integral. So I essentially integrate out a lot of things. Do I really know, do I really need the full wave function with all its details to get an observable, which is maybe just a number or maybe a simple function? Or couldn't this observable depend on uh, a much more compact information on some other quantity, which is not the many body wave function, but some quantity, which I call Q here, and depend on this Q. And this Q, which might be much less complex than the wave function, could also fully describe our observable, but as I said, be much simpler. So Q could be anything, it could be itself also an observable, for example. And then you have a double problem. So you have to know this Q and you have to know how your observable depends on Q. And this means you have to know the functional O of Q. And the most well-known case for this is certainly density functional theory. So in density functional theory, this Q which is what describes your system, which is what contains the information you need, is simply the electronic density. And the density is, of course, a very simple object. It's just a function of space. 
And uh, the problem is that, of course, you don't know the density. And so in uh, density functional theory comes a second idea by Kohn and Sham, which is to say, if I want to calculate the density, I can actually use an auxiliary system. So an auxiliary system is a system uh, which is simpler than the original system. In this case, it's a system without interaction, but where I have tuned the potential such that I will get the density in principle exactly. And so to tune this potential means I add a potential to the already existing external potential. And this thing that we have to add is the classical electrostatic Hartree potential and everything we don't know, which is called the exchange correlation potential, VXC. So in this case, we can overcome the first problem, how to get the density if we manage to get this VXC. And then we have to know, of course, how the observable depends on the density, which is a super difficult problem. People who use density functional theory mostly try to uh, get total energy. So the observable would be the energy of the system. And they try to find how the energy depends on the density. So the, the energy as a functional of the density. And of course, they try to have a good uh, exchange correlation potential, which would give you the density itself. So to overcome these two problems. There are actually not many observables that are easy to express in terms of the density. And we have a particular problem with spectroscopy. We usually don't know how to express spectra in terms of the density. So many people often, since they don't know the function of the density, simply take this auxiliary system, which was actually designed to just calculate the density. And in this auxiliary system, they also calculate other observables, for example, spectra. And this is, of course, a very rough approximation. If you want to do better, and in particular for spectroscopy, you must pay the price to have a little more uh, complex descriptor. So not as difficult as the full many body wave function, but a little more. And one possibility is Green's functions. <clears throat> so here we have the one body Green's function, G of R R prime and omega. It's more complicated than the density. It depends on two space variables. So we say it's non-local and it depends on frequency. And you have, as before, the problem, how to get the Green's function and how to get your observables. Concerning the first question, how to get the Green's function, we take the same route as the density functional people. We build an auxiliary system. But in this case, because we want to have a more complicated object, we also need a more complicated potential. And this potential-like object is called an electron self-energy, and it's itself non-local and frequency dependent, and it's a functional of the Green's function. It's also not known. We have to find good approximations. But if you have it, you can calculate the one-body Green's function. And the advantage of the one-body Green's function with respect to the density is that uh, we know more observables as a functional of the Green's function. So we know how to express a lot of important observables in terms of this one body Green's function. And the most important example is probably the spectral function and even a momentum resolved spectral function, which is what you would measure in photo emission. And this is a very simple functional of the one body Green's function. It's actually just linked to its imaginary part. We also know how to uh, express exactly in principle the total energy as a functional of the one body Green's function. And then there are other things that we do not know. For example, if you want to calculate absorption, you need a dielectric function. There we only have approximations and you can continue like that. Still other people, and I don't know whether this is the case uh, in your institution, do dynamical mean field theory. And the uh, people who are doing dynamical mean fields theory, they are mostly interested in the local Green's function, which means that the one body Green's function projected on uh, sites, sites of a, let's say, discrete material. And uh, the corresponding auxiliary potential is also a local, a site local auxiliary uh, self energy, and it's a frequency dependent and a functional of the local Green's function. And in this case, if you have the local Green's function, you know the local spectral function, whereas you have to approximate the momentum resolved spectral function. And there are many, many uh, examples like that. You can talk about reduced density matrix functionals. Uh, and if you want to have a more general view, you can look at uh, 
uh, papers uh, from our group also. Now, what is common to all this is that we know, do not know in principle any of these auxiliary potentials. Sometimes we also have auxiliary interactions. We just don't know them. We have sort of shifted the problem. So we have some ideas how to get them. For example, in the Green's function world, often we use perturbation theory, many body perturbation theory, but we stop at low order. It's still rough approximations. And uh, to have a different view, we can look at what density functional people actually do. And that is something that uh, maybe many of you know. So what is a typical approximation strategy in density functional theory to get these auxiliary potentials? Well, suppose you have your real material here on the right side and you're interested in your auxiliary potential or the unknown part of it, this VXC of R in a given point R. The first and simplest approximation in density functional theory is to say, I don't know how to calculate this in the real material, but I know how to calculate this in a much simpler system, namely the homogeneous electron gas. And I will try just to replace in a given point the potential by the potential of the homogeneous electron gas. And this is called the local density approximation because Korn and Sham, when they introduced this, propose to use the electron gas that has the same density as your material in this point. So if you're in this point, you would maybe take the homogeneous electron gas with the same density. If you're interested in another point, well, you have to take another homogeneous electron gas that has the, the density of that point and so on. So that's the local density approximation, which is really what made uh, density functional theory feasible because otherwise there wouldn't have been a reasonable approximation. Now, this idea that in every point you can take the model that has the density of that point is completely based on Walter Cohn's intuition of nearsightedness, namely that physics is really uh, not depending on what the butterfly does on Neptune, but uh, what is close to the point you're interested in. Actually, a very similar idea uh, can be used to understand dynamical mean field theory. As I said, in dynamical mean field theory, you are uh, working with local self energies, site local, frequency dependent, and local Green's functions. And uh, you also have a material and you also have a model. And the only difference is that your model is the Anderson impurity model. It's not the homogeneous electron gas. But also in that case, in the case of DMFT, you have an idea of nearsightedness and uh, the material in a given point at a given site, in that case, is replaced by the Anderson impurity model that has the same local spectral function as the material itself. So it's actually very similar in spirit to the LDA. So what they have in common is that you take the results that you do not know how to get in the real material from a model, and that you suppose that you can link the model and the real material by supposing nearsightedness. And what is really important here and what is the big difference between DFT and uh, dynamic mean field theory is that in the case of DFT, the homogeneous electron gas that was the model was calculated once and forever in quantum Monte Carlo by Sepoli and Alder. And these results were actually tabulated, stored, they were interpolated, and they are still used today for our calculations of real materials. So when you do a DFT calculation and you use something like the local density approximation, but also more advanced uh, approximations, you actually never recalculate the complex exchange correlation effects. You always take them from those people who have done the work once and forever for us. And so this concept of working once, storing and sharing is what guides us in our research today. You could ask why this hasn't been done in other contexts, for example, why didn't the MFT people yet store and interpolate the Anderson impurity model? You have to, of course, to ask these uh, to the people, but uh, one ingredient is uh, certainly the fact that the self energy is frequency dependent, so it makes it more complicated. But I think that we could do this actually today with today's computer power and storage. Another problem, if you think about our Green's functions, and we're doing a lot of many body perturbation theory in our group actually, 
is that the self energies are usually non local. And so the concept of nearsightedness is not so easy to transpose to a, con uh, to a context where you don't have a local potential from the very beginning. So you don't know what is the point R uh, in, in which you should take your model because there's also a point R prime, right? So there is reasons to say that it's not so straightforward, but definitely what we want to do uh, is to learn from this very successful local density approximation in DFT and related approximations and enlarge the concept of working once, storing and sharing results. And we want to, to do this by going beyond the nearsightedness and also beyond density functional theory. We do not want to be limited to density functional theory. Uh, the basic idea is really uh, like uh, the evolution of playing Lego. If you want, when I was a child, our Lego pieces were all very small. And if you had to build a complicated object, uh, then this was very, very difficult. And uh, this is like solving the many body Schrodinger equation, I would say. Now today, if you want to build such an engine, for example, Lego gives you already uh, the prefabricated uh, wheels and other pieces, and that makes uh, life much easier. And of course, it speeds up a lot your construction, right? And if you think of uh, us doing spectroscopy, for example, this is a photo emission spectrum, an experimental photo emission spectrum of a simple material, aluminum. You see the band structure here, you see satellite structure, uh, you see building blocks, and you would really like to have these building blocks and assemble your spectrum instead of going pixel by pixel. So if you can do this, we will be faster, we will calculate less, which is certainly something that we should do now that we are really uh, very much interested in ecology, right? And we will also get better understanding because we can uh, understand these building blocks also once and forever. And we also then only have to understand the assembly. Okay, so how do we do this? So we keep the idea that in every point in the real material, and when I say point, we have to generalize. This can be a point in real space, in reciprocal space, in frequency space. So at every point, we can replace the result of the unknown thing, potential or observable, what be, by the result of a suitably tuned model. Okay. And so this doesn't have to be the model that has the same value as the point we are in, but somehow they must be linked. For example, in the case of the density functional application, if we look for the exchange correlation potential, which in the LDA is given by the potential of the homogeneous electron gas at the same density of the point R, now it will be given by a homogeneous electron gas with a density which sort of depends on the point R, but it's not the density in the point R. It's some density that we have to find and for which in principle there exists an exact value. So in most cases, if we choose cleverly which model we take to simulate this point, we would get the exact answer. We can imagine from physical intuition that this exact answer must be some kind of average around the point where we are, not a simple average, but somehow it must be linked of what happens in a reasonable region around it, because still we believe that uh, the butterfly or Neptune would not influence our result. Otherwise we would never do calculations, okay? So this quantity, this density in this case, or more generally this descriptor of the model system that we have to know, we call it the connector because this is what really connects our model and our real material. So the model can be the homogeneous electron gas, but we are not bound to the homogeneous electron gas. Already I've shown you in DMFT, there are other models and we can more generally look for the best models that we can uh, employ here. For the homogeneous electron gas and density functional theory, lots of people have thought about how to go beyond the LDA, of course, and I cannot even give credit to all of them. But now, as I said, we want to go to other models. Uh, we want to generalize this. Uh, we would like to employ the same concept for other quantities, not necessarily within the MFT, could also be self energies, for example, or the Green's function itself. And so uh, uh, we have to find an approximation strategy because it's clear that we will not have the exact result, uh, at least not easily. Okay. Our approximation strategy 
consists in saying that since we uh, will not guess which of the models we should take to simulate a point in a given real system, we will approximate our material. This is now becoming pink. And we will also approximate our model. And we will use the same approximation for the model and the real material. For example, we could make it interaction free or something like that. Okay. And then we think that in this approximate system, now we can find the connector. And when, once we have found this approximate connector, we will take it and inject it in the relation between the true model and uh, the real material. And the idea is that, that by making the same approximation both on the model and on the real material, we will benefit from error cancelling. So if I do this as an exercise for the case of DFT, but as I said, it's not the only goal that we have. So if I do it for the exchange correlation potential, we are asking for the exchange correlation potential of the real material. We know we can get it from the homogeneous electron gas at a given density that we have to find. In principle, so this is a, home, a monotonic function. We could just invert it and we could in principle write down this exact connector density. But in that case, we would have to know the result that we are looking for that we don't know. So that's not a good strategy, of course except for intellectual interest. So what we do is our approximation strategy. We approximate both the, approx the, the expression for the real material and the expression for the homogeneous electron gas or whatsoever model. This gives us the approximate connector. And you can see here this inversion, which makes that we have error canceling because we are using the same approximation. And then we insert, we use this approximate connector density in the true expression of the gas to get an approximation for our exchange correlation potential. This procedure is correct in two limits. One, if our approximation is very, very good, it's becoming exact. But the other one is also for a very lousy approximation if your model approaches the real system. So your model carries information about the real system and uh, these two limits together with the error cancelling make that this is a promising approach. Um, so of course the model cannot be completely crazy because otherwise you don't gain by uh, determining and storing the information on the model. And um, uh, you gain a lot instead if the approximation is not so good but the model is very, very uh, pertinent. And just as a small example, um, is a, a work done by Ayuba Wina, and uh, he has calculated the exchange energy uh, in a Koncham uh, local density approximation um, for uh, helium and silicon. And here we'll give you errors in percentage. So here we think now, so we are out of this designing density functionals with uh, uh, for the exchange correlation potential. We think that we know the exchange correlation potential but we don't want to calculate the exchange energy because the exchange energy involves a density matrix and this is a little bit costly. So we would like to know a simpler way to get the density matrix, okay? A very simple approximation to get the density matrix, the one body density matrix is to say, how, how does the expression look like if I have a single electron? It turns out in the case of a single electron, the density matrix is the geometric average of the densities in the two points where you look at the density matrix. So this is our single electron approximation. If you use this single appro uh, electron approximation to calculate the density matrix and therefore the exchange energy, you will find that you have a terrible result. So you're off by 160% in helium and 575% in bike silicon. So helium is a little better than silicon because you know you have this uh, very few electrons localized on every atom but it's still you will admit a very very bad result now we will use the connector procedure so we use the same approximation uh, for your real system and for the model system so for the model system we take the homogeneous electron gas density matrix depends only on the distance between the two points but uh, in this approximation, when you are in the homogeneous electron gas and you just take the geometric average, the density matrix equals the density itself. 
So we can immediately uh, equal the density matrix in the model and in the real system and invert the uh, expression. And it turns out that the connector density itself is the geometric average of the two densities. And then we use this connector expression to approximate the density matrix in the real system as the density matrix of the homogeneous electron gas taken at the connector density, which is the geometric average. And then we look at the results. And you see that in helium, we got the error down by a factor of three. It's still a bad result. But in silicon, we got the uh, error down by a factor of 100. And now this starts to be acceptable. And it's actually a very, very simple calculation. And it illustrates one point. Namely, if the model is far from the real system, as it is in the case of helium, which is very inhomogeneous, very far from the homogeneous electron gas, you do not gain so much by the connector approach. But if, as in the case of silicon, the material starts to be a little more homogeneous, then you have a huge gain. So then, uh, this is a procedure that we want to use in many cases. And uh, it needs, as you have seen, that we can calculate the model exactly and with controlled approximations. And this in a wide parameter range, because we have to take a, a, a given parameter set for every point in configuration space in our real system. And this brings me to the model side. And here we have a lot of gaps to fill actually, especially on the spectroscopy side. And uh, uh, if we, for example, take the homogeneous electron gas as a model. And here I hand over to Matteo um, because uh, this is interest by itself. And this is also something where I think we can make a lot of uh, links uh, with your work. And so if there are no questions now, I just let Matteo talk and get out of here. Okay, good afternoon. I don't know if there are questions, otherwise I will share the screen. Okay. Do you see my presentation? Yeah, I see. Yeah. It. Okay, very good. So, um, Lucia has uh, just uh, explained why we are interested in the calculation in a very the image electron gas. In particular case, here we will uh, deal with the um, density response function of the image electron gas. And we want to use uh, the accurate methods of um, many body perturbation theory to calculate the response function. Uh, this accurate method of many body perturbation theory is called beta Peter equation, which is in principle exact for the response function. And in practice, it's normally used in an approximation that is the GW approximation. Uh, screen the Coulomb interaction W that is screened by the inverse the electric function um, with respect to the bare Coulomb interaction VC that is not screened. And uh, uh, in the GW approximation, the screening is calculated in the random phase approximation. The Vettel-Salpeter equation calculation is a two-step calculation. In the first step, the screening is entering the self-energy through this expression that is GW, which is the product of the single particle Green's function and uh, the skin column. And we use the self-energy to take into account uh, the electron-electron repulsion. The second step, the screened Coulomb interaction is describing the electronal attraction. And the final result of the beta salpeter equation is, for example, the um, the electric function as a function of wave vector and frequency. The beta salpeter equation in the GW approximation is the state of the art method for the calculation of excitons in solid. Here, I'm just showing you an example. It's a comparison between the uh, dynamic structure factor measured by an elastic ray scattering experiment as a function of energy and momentum. So this is on the left. And on the right, it's the calculation uh, of the same quantity, the dynamic structure factor, as a function of energy and momentum in lithium fluoride. It is a prototypical material, what band gap material, where there are uh, important excitonic effects. And here you can observe that there is a feature that is 
the uh, lowest energy uh, exciton that has a dispersion as a function of momentum transfer. And this is very well reproduced by uh, the calculations in this GW approximation for the beta salpeter uh, equation. Um, so the physics, as I said, is the screened of the screening of the uh, Coulomb interaction. And uh, the microscopic screening in the case of uh, semiconductors can be just expressed by the macroscopic dielectric function. And uh, the um, electronal interaction, this, this screen Coulomb interaction W, is just a renormalized Coulomb interaction with, where the renormalization is just given by this number epsilon. And if we take a simple case of uh, two parabolic bands, we obtain with this uh, picture the Vanier model for excitons that are just describing a correlated electronal pair embedded in a crystal. And this uh, embedding is described by this microscopic dielectric function. What we obtain is a series of excitonic energies that are just a renormalized Rydberg series of uh, uh, discrete levels. This applies for uh, semiconductors and insulating materials. In metals, the uh, screening is qualitatively different. The screen Coulomb interaction doesn't have any more this long range uh, Coulomb expression, but it becomes a Yukawa uh, uh, potential that has this uh, completely different form. And this is a consequence of the fact that the macroscopic screening cannot be just described by a single number, but it's uh, rather a function that depends on the wave vector uh, Q. And you see in particular that in the case of uh, uh, Q going to zero, so in the long wavelength limit, the screening is divergent, so it's infinite. You see that uh, metals and semiconductors are qualitatively different. What we expect in metals is actually that there are no uh, excitonic effects because of this uh, divergence of the uh, uh, um, screening of the epsilon. And uh, so we can think that the electron uh, all attraction is completely dumped by this uh, perfect screening at long distances. The Sulpeter calculations uh, for metals. And uh, for example, this is the reference. Um, and for uh, aluminum or uh, um, copper, they have found indeed there are, the, there are no excitonic effects in the absorption spectrum. For core levels, this is a different story. And I refer to the classical words by Mann, Nozier, and Dominicis to describe uh, excitonic effects in core levels. Here, we are just interested in uh, valence excitations. Uh, so, excitons. The collective excitations of uh, uh, metals are described by the um, already the classical works in the random phase approximation, uh, where you uh, can assume that the metals, the prototypical metal, is the homogeneous electron gas. And in this case, what we find uh, instead of excitons are plasmons that are uh, the consequence of the long range uh, part of the Coulomb interaction. Plasmons are collective excitations that are visible for a small momentum transfer at high energy. They, from um, the poles in the response function chi, as a collective mode that are completely distinct from the continuum of the interband transitions, that is this particle uh, continuum that is depicted here. The difference being that the uh, plasmons are living in a different energy range and momentum range with respect to this uh, particular continuum. This is the classical picture of the homogeneous electron gas for uh, uh, densities that are similar to the densities of uh, simple metals. And this is already captured in the random phase approximation. The important observation is that the perfect screening, meaning that the divergence of the dielectric function is happening only at uh, uh, long distances and long times which means that at short distances and short times, the picture could be different. And indeed, uh, if we look at uh, results from the literature uh, for the low density homogeneous electron gas, we find in the recent work by Takada that he uh, did calculations in advanced uh, approximations of time dependency functional theory. Um, he calculated the response function of the homogeneous electron gas at temperature zero. And he, he, find, he finds besides this uh, plasma excitation, other excitations that is naming uh, excitonic collective mode and ghost excitons. So this is um, 
at uh, first sight very strange because we have just said that in metals we don't expect to see excitonic features. So how can we understand? And uh, uh, first of all, we wanted to verify that we are able to reproduce these uh, features also with our advanced kernels in TDFT. And uh, therefore, we uh, used a kernel that was developed in this work that is advanced in the sense that it is uh, uh, non-local in uh, space and time. It's uh, dependent on uh, the wave vector Q and it's dependent on the frequency. So it's this 2P2H uh, kernel that takes into account two particle, two whole excitations. Of this calculation is indeed uh, qualitatively similar to the result found by Takada. This is the dynamic structure factor for uh, um, RS8, it is already a low density of electron gas at a large momentum transfer. And there is a peak that can be associated to this uh, collective exciton mode, which is not present in the random phase approximation. But this low energy peak at large momentum transfer is indeed what Takada has found what, with his uh, parameterization. And uh, the advantage of uh, the new electron gas is also that we have uh, quantum Monte Carlo benchmarks. And here I'm showing uh, the benchmark related to the calculation of the static screening. So it's the inverse electric function for uh, frequency zero as a function of a uh, wave vector. So on the x-axis, you have the wave vector. And here in the two panels, there are two different densities. Rs equal four, that is the density of sodium, and Rs equal eight, it is already a quite low uh, density. Here it's in uh, black, the benchmark it is uh, from uh, the parameterization of Corradini del Sole, Onida, and Palummo on the basis of the Quantum Monte Carlo work by Moroni and uh, co workers. This is a calculation in Quantum Monte Carlo at uh, zero temperature. That has been also confirmed by more recent calculation using diagrammatic uh, quantum Monte Carlo. And then there is, of course, all the work that has been done recently by uh, Tobias and uh, co-workers in the regime of warm dense matter. Here we are focusing in uh, the uh, zero uh, temperature limit. Okay, so for us, the benchmark will be this uh, uh, quantum Monte Carlo results from uh, Moroni and co-workers. So the benchmark is in uh, uh, black in the two cases. And in orange, you have a calculation that is done using the adiabatic local density approximation. That is an approximation with respect to this uh, uh, Corradini parameterization that is just taking the long uh, uh, wavelength limit, the Q equal zero limit of this um, uh, parameterization of the kernel in TDFT. And we can notice two things. The first one is that at low, density, meaning large RS, the uh, static screening becomes negative in this uh, region of wave vector. And the second uh, observation we can make is that qualitatively, the adiabatic local density approximation is good and is giving results that are in agreement uh, with the quantum Monte Carlo benchmark, at least for these densities that are not so low. So for these densities, the uh, adiabatic local density approximation is similar to, to the benchmark. Now, what about the beta sulfater equation? And first of all, why we want to use the beta sulfater equation? First is that we want to have spectra and there is no quantum Monte Carlo benchmark at t equals zero for uh, spectra that are at finite energies, finite excitation energies. What I've just shown here are just benchmarks for the static screening. The second thing is that we want to have analysis tools. The calculations that I have just shown so far have been done using time dependency functional theory, where we don't have analysis tools of the results. And in particular, it's difficult to distinguish between plasmon and excitons. And uh, this is uh, also uh, in addition to the fact that we want to have accurate results for uh, uh, models, and in particular for the energy electron gas in the framework of connector theory. In the following, I will use a static GW approximation for the self energy. So the input will be always a static uh, dielectric function and the output of the beta sulfate equation will be uh, the full uh, spectra. So uh, at the beginning, I was saying that uh, if we take the microscopic screening, we find that there is a perfect uh, screening. But in reality, even if we stay in the random phase approximation, 
we can see that the screen interaction in real space is uh, not completely dumped. It means that the screening is not perfect at short distances, even in the random phase approximation, which uh, translates into the fact that there is a strong electron uh, interaction at short distances. Here I'm showing the random phase approximation calculated W, sc the screening interaction, with respect to the bare interaction. And you see that at short distances, the interaction, the screen interaction that we use in the beta sulfate equation at the level of the uh, random phase approximation is not zero. It means that we can expect some uh, results, some excitonic uh, effects, even in a metal, even in the homogeneous electron gas. And now we uh, can compare the results of the calculation done in the beta sulfate equation uh, for the static screening with the benchmark that is in, in black. The beta uh, calculation is in blue. And you see that um, the beta sulfate calculation is far from the benchmark and it remains very close to the random phase approximation where the electron uh, attraction, where excitonic effects are not included, are neglected completely. We see that uh, the standard GW beta sulfate equation just uh, capture a part of these uh, uh, effects that should go from the green curve, that is the random phase approximation, to the benchmark, that is the full result. We also see that since the random phase approximation is not able to capture the negative screening, that this negative screening is an excitonic effect. And as I said, the GW uh, beta cell pattern is able just to capture part of this effect. This is for uh, uh, low densities, meaning uh, large RS, but the qualitative uh, same result is also obtained at uh, densities that are comparable to the density of sodium. Also in this case, where the screening is always uh, positive, which is uh, uh, the regime where we don't expect strongly correl uh, correlation effects. Also in this case, the beta cell pattern equation remains too close to the random phase approximation. It means that the standard GW uh, beta cell pattern equation over screens. There is too much screening with respect to uh, what we should obtain. The second uh, feature that uh, the beta cell pattern, the static uh, GW beta cell pattern equation is missing is the description of the collective modes that are defines, defined as the zeros of the real part of the dielectric function as a function of wave vector energy. So typically what we plot is uh, the set of frequencies for which this uh, uh, relation is uh, uh, satisfied as a function of momentum. Here you have in uh, uh, green, the result of the random phase approximation. So this green line corresponds to the plasma dispersion that I've shown uh, previously that has been calculated in the uh, random phase approximation. In orange, you have the result of uh, uh, obtained using the adiabatic local density approximation. And in uh, blue, you have the result of uh, the GW beta sulfator. And also in this case, you see that the GW beta sulfator remains too close to the random phase approximation. And qualitatively, it misses two features that are important at uh, very low densities like RS equal 22. The first one is the negative plasma dispersion. So it, this means that at small momentum transfers, the plasmon should disperse with the negative slope, contrary to what is expected, uh, what is found in the random phase approximation. And you see that the beta cell beta equation is not able to reproduce this feature. And the second feature is this large uh, dispersing uh, feature that is uh, present at large momentum transfer and small energies. That is the collective exciton mode that I've shown you in the spectra at, at the beginning. And this is connected with the negative static screening and it's something that should be measurable because these, is, these are features that are uh, uh, peaks that can be measured in the dynamic structure factor. And the beta cell pattern equation completely miss this feature as well. This is because we use an approximation for the uh, screen column interaction that is based on the random phase approximation, which itself is poor uh, for uh, um, low RS, uh, sorry, for low densities and for uh, uh, um, 
uh, yeah, it's uh, bad. The random phase approximation is good only for uh, low RS and uh, for a uh, small Q, and it's bad for uh, uh, low densities and large momentum transfer. And we have seen that the adiabatic local density approximation is much better. So we could think that instead of using the random phase approximation, we could use the adiabatic local density approximation as an input for our bethesen peter equation. But if we do so, we actually get that results even are worse than the standard uh, GW beta salpeter uh, equation. And the reason is that the screen Coulomb interaction calculated in the adiabatic local density approximation is even weaker than the random phase approximation. And we see this here. We are comparing the bare Coulomb interaction in black, the uh, screen Coulomb interaction in the random phase approximation in blue, and the screen Coulomb interaction calculated in uh, adiabatic local density approximation in light blue. And you see that at short distances, this interaction is even weaker in the ALDA with respect to the random phase approximation. So it means that if having a good approximation for the uh, screen Coulomb interaction is not enough to obtain a, a good uh, spectrum as an output. It also means that we cannot expect that the uh, final result should be equal to the input that we use to screen the Coulomb interaction. In practice, it means that we have to go beyond the GW beta salpeter equation to calculate uh, the response function in the gas. Why it is so? We have observed that there is an overscreening at short distances. The, and the screening in W expresses the classical electrostatic potential that is induced by a charge response. This is a classical picture. We have the induced uh, artery potential that is a screen in the Coulomb interaction. And this is purely classical. It's purely electrostatic uh, potential. It means that we are treating this in uh, including a self-polarization effect. It means that the electrons and holes are also screening themselves. It means, in uh, other words, that we should also take into account, besides the induced artery uh, potential, also an induced exchange correlation potential because the electrons and the holes are fermions. So they should also feel this induced exchange correlation potential. And we know from uh, previous uh, works that the self-polarization correction should weaken the screening, in particular at short distances, which is the effect that uh, we miss in this uh, uh, GW beta salpeter equation uh, that I've shown so far. And a simple way to take into account this correction that is in the jargon of many body perturbation theory called a vertex, uh, vertex correction is to take a local approximation to the self energy, which should be a good approximation in the gas where the self energy is expected to be uh, pretty local. It means that instead of using the standard uh, expression for the dielectric function in terms of the response function, we should replace this by uh, a test charge test electron uh, dielectric function, where besides the induced artery potential, we also take into account an induced exchange correlation potential. And this induced exchange correlation potential enters the expression of this test charge test electron dielectric function through uh, the kernel, the FXC kernel of TDFT. So this is the ingredient that we use now to calculate the response function uh, including vertex corrections um, using the beta salpeter equation. So we go beyond the standard GW beta salpeter equation uh, approach by taking into account this induced exchange correlation uh, potential. Uh, we calculate the screen Coulomb interaction using this test charge test electron uh, approximation, and the result is uh, here in uh, uh, red. And uh, again, we compare the screen Coulomb interaction uh, calculated in these uh, um, different approximations that are uh, the R random phase approximation that was our starting point, the ALDA that is uh, even uh, weaker, and the bare Coulomb interaction that is in blue, in blue, sorry, in black. And you see that at short distances, this new test charge test electron interaction that is in red it's even stronger than the bare uh, Coulomb interaction. And uh, if we go to the reciprocal space, we see that as a function of momentum transfer, this test charge test electron screen uh, Coulomb interaction develops a peak at more or less 2 kF. 
that is qualitatively different with respect to uh, the other interactions. So with this uh, uh, screen column interaction, we calculate now the static screening, and the result is shown uh, again in red for this uh, uh, low density. And you see that now we go in the good direction. So we go from the standard G uh, GW beta cell pattern uh, calculation in uh, blue to the red curve. And you see that qualitatively, we are able to reproduce this negative screening at uh, uh, low densities that is in agreement with uh, the benchmark results. You see that we are able at least qualitatively to reproduce the, the, the benchmark result, but still, this is not the end of the story. This is still an approximation, but at least we understand the physics, why we get this negative screening and this uh, uh, collective exit on mode that was uh, put forward by uh, Takada. This is due to this uh, short range uh, um, interaction that, has, that is very strong uh, in the case of this test chart, test electron uh, screening. And indeed, if we calculate the collective modes in this approach, we see that we are able to reproduce both the negative plasma dispersion at low momentum transfers and this uh, uh, very dispersing uh, uh, collective exciton mode in agreement with the uh, adiabatic local density approximation calculation. Both features are um, present only if we take into account this test charge test electron screening not if we take into account uh, screening at the level of the Coulomb interaction at the level of the random phase approximation. And finally, this is the last message. Uh, having uh, the beta cell petri equation has the advantage that we can analyze the results contrary to, uh, in principle, time dependency functional theory. And in particular, we can uh, plot the exciton wave function that is a two particle wave function for the electron hole pair. So it's a function of the position of the hole and the position of the electron. Typically, we fix the position of the hole and we plot the electron charge uh, associated with this uh, uh, fixed position of the hole. Here, I'm showing the case of the lithium fluoride and the hole has been fixed at, at the center and displayed is the electronic charge. An effect of the electron uh, attraction is the localization of the electron charge around the hole. Now we can do the same for the case of the collective exciton mode. And we see that the uh, wave function associated to this mode is very, uh, in is very anisotropic in the homogeneous electron gas. It has uh, a, a circular uh, shape in the uh, direction that is in the plane that is perpendicular to the momentum that is here along uh, Z. So in the XY plane is completely uh, spherical as it should be. And it is um, completely delocalized along uh, the direction of the momentum. And the same is also obtained if we calculate this wave function used using the adiabatic local density approximation. And this is striking because as I said, in principle, time dependent density functional theory is not supposed to uh, give the um, exciton wave function, the analysis of the spectra. In principle, TDFT is supposed to give spectra exactly, but not the exciton uh, wave function. It's like in DFT, um, the fact that uh, we can obtain the density in principle exactly, but consham orbitals in principle have no physical meaning. Here it's, it's uh, the analogous uh, situation. So to summarize, what we have found is that exciton effects do exist in metals. They give rise to negative screening and collective exciton modes in the homogeneous electron gas that vertex corrections that are describing this self-polarization correction are needed in order to describe these excitonic effects and they are the key ingredient to correct the overscreening that is found at the level of the random phase approximation the aldia the alda is already fine in the gap in the ominous electron gas and this points to the fact that the important physics is happening at short distances this is not the end of the story. Um, these uh, 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 vertex corrections to the GW beta cell petri equation are qualitatively giving the good results, but still um, they are not in perfect uh, quantitative agreement uh, with the, the benchmark um, for the static screening. And we think that there is still an underestimation of uh, um, this uh, uh, negative screening that is due to the 
overscaling that can be further decreased if we take into account dynamical effects in the screen column interaction. And we think that this uh, approach that has been recently developed in this paper that is beyond the beta cell petri equation that is based on equivalent expansion is very promising to take in, into account this dynamical effect in the framework of many body perturbation theory. And this is all, so I can give the floor back to Lucia for the end. Okay, I think uh, we have been a little long. So now Mohamed has to pardon me, but I think we don't really have the time to come to the last uh, uh, part in the official seminar. Maybe if someone's interested, since we will continue with the discussion, we can talk about this. Let me just come back to the outline, maybe. Um, so I will try to share. And uh, hoping. Can you see my screen? Looks good. Yeah. OK, so we had said that we would maybe give an example. And this was Mohammed's work. So just to tell you what he has been doing in case there are questions, um, he has shown that he can get the charge density as an explicit functional of the Kohn-Sham potential. This means that when you do a Kohn-Sham calculation in order to calculate the density, you do not have to diagonalize the Hamiltonian anymore. And he has been doing this using connector theory. And I come back to connector theory because our motivation actually to work on the homogeneous electron gas was very much uh, inspired by the fact that we need, we have to have our models under control. That means, we have to be able to produce benchmark results and we have to be able to uh, get the models with controlled approximations I have shown you. So what Matteo has presented is just sort of an example of how difficult is actually also just the model part, right? So if you have questions about how you can get uh, the charge density of a material uh, as a simple, uh, let's say with a simple formula dependent on the uh, Kunsham potential, you can ask uh, Mohammed in the discussion, I would suggest. Okay, so I skip over this. And um, also the last application. And I will just uh, uh, summarize maybe. So we are working on using this idea of connecting model and real systems by uh, exploring many observables as a functional of something, of the density, of the external potential, of other things. Um, we get, for example, band structures as a functional of uh, ingredients from the homogeneous electron gas without diagonalizing Hamiltonians. And uh, what we really need is more flexible model systems and more people who help us to uh, get these uh, uh, model results. We, we are thinking of inhomogeneous model systems in particular, and we will probably also need some machine learning to complete the model databases. In any case, our guideline is to work once, to have very good results on the models, to store them, to interpolate them, and to share them. And it's in particular this point of sharing, uh, which we would like to put forward. And with this, I apologize for us being a little long, and we are looking forward to discuss with you. And let me just put back the people who did the work. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for excellent talk and to both of you. Um, before I open up question to everybody, or Right, people already uh, can unmute yourself. Um, I will go ahead and uh, ask the first question, which is going to be a weird one. It is about um, electronic nearsightedness. In particular, you said um, a butterfly on Neptune uh, does not impact your results, and I would agree. Um, my question is um, Have you thought about uh, superconductivity and DCS uh, transition? Because I, my, my gut feeling would, would tell me that then uh, electronic nearsightedness would be expected to break down. Is it true? I, I think it will break down in many cases, and in particular when you have these phase transitions to some uh, collective phase, certainly. The question is maybe, as I have uh, pointed out at some point, um, when we say nearsightedness, we think in real space, but we don't have to think in real space. We can think in some other space. And the interesting question is maybe whether we have to switch space and be nearsighted in some other space, right? <laughs> It is true. It is okay. It's a very good point in particular for something like superconductivity. Yeah, yeah, okay. Mm. I can see that. Um, second question I have, and this is already uh, becoming more specific, is um, okay.
Okay, so you guys are used to think in terms uh, of the self energy, which in some sense, uh, right, it, it truncates your hierarchy of free functions, if I remember correctly, and it takes into account the exchange collation effects. Whereas uh, we, from the quantum Monte Carlo perspective, but also from the density functional theory perspective, and we are more used to think in terms of, yeah, I would, for the case of a uniform electron gas, I would call it local field correction, but it's actually the exchange collation kernel. Right, so we are we are used to think in terms of let's say a, a density density correlator, whereas uh, the self energy would be the analogous uh, concept in terms of the single particle green functions. So my I suppose my question is um, is there a straightforward connection and a particular connection that one can actually evaluate between the exchange correlation kernel that you would have in density functional theory, for example, and the self energy? Mm -hmm. Matthias, you want to answer or? No, okay, that we, we can combine, combine. So there are many uh, relations. First of all, we have to look at what we want to calculate, right? So if we use a self energy, we want to calculate a one body Green's function. But we are, when we're doing Green's functions, we are not only calculating one body Green's functions, we might, for example, want to calculate a two body Green's function. A two body Green's function, if you take a certain diagonal of the two body Green's function, you get your density density response function, okay? And um, uh, the two body Green's function is actually what is calculated essentially in the beta salpeta equation that Matteo has presented. And the beta salpeta equation has a kernel, which is the functional derivative of the self energy with respect to the one body Green's function. This is the strict analog of the exchange correlation kernel in TDDFT that you are referring to, which is the functional derivative of the exchange correlation potential with respect to the density. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you can, in principle, calculate your density density response function directly in TDDFT using your exchange correlation kernel, or you can, in principle, also exactly get the same response function going through Green's functions and having this other kernel that lives, I must precise, be precise on this in a different space because your density thing lives in the space of densities. So shifting a density from one point to another, huh? making a density variation. When you do Green's functions, you live in a space where particles move. So you have an electron that moves from one place to another. So you have two places for the electrons. And the hole also moves from one place to another. This makes you four places. okay? And therefore, the beta salpeta equation is a huge object with four places. And therefore, you have to take the diagonal to get the density density response function. So this means we can get at the end the same thing, but we do a little deviation. And of course, there are links at all levels. And for example, you can write down the exact exchange correlation kernel of TDDFT in terms of the kernel of the beta cell beta equation. We have links in many places. And on the other hand, we in Palizzo, we like to combine methods. So as Matteo has shown, we use TDDFT to improve our Green's functions with a cost that is uh, lower than if we stay in the complete exact Green's function framework. There are a lot of bridges, and this is actually a, a big interest of our discussion. Yeah, this is, uh, makes perfect sense. Uh, thank you very much for that. It's also consistent to, to what my, my colleague Jan Vorberger, whom you might or might not know, um, has been telling me. And my question is, or my, my intuition would be, is it true um, that the exchange collation kernel then uh, contains less information than the self energy you would have in the green function framework? Or to say it the other way around, would it be possible to reconstruct some amount of that maybe partial information about the self energy from knowledge of the exchange collation kernel? Right, because I'm thinking and um, potentially, right, we can get the exchange correlation kernel, at least in some cases, let's say for homogeneous electron gas at finite temperature. Mm -hmm. um, would it then be possible, you say it's a functional derivative of the self energy with respect to the single particle mean function, as I can understand, would it be possible to invert this relation uh, to get the, the self energy from the kernel? Okay, okay. depends uh, what you mean exactly, because as I said, so you you have to compare the exchange correlation kernel not to the self energy but to its functional derivative let's say the, yeah. the equivalent role is played by the functional derivative okay since this is an object of only two points and the other one is an object of four points you will immediately see that it will be very difficult to invent this information somehow okay of course you might object that since we believe in density functional theory 
everything is a function of the density. Okay. And in some way, you must be able to reconstruct the information. But of course, we have no clue of how to do this. So I would say that, um, uh, that no, no, we don't know how to do this. And this is because we usually go the other way by taking diagonals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I could give a, a simpler example to illustrate this point. If you have the density, if you look at the density matrix and the density, the density is a diagonal of the density matrix. Okay, so there are people doing density functional theory and people doing density matrix functional theory. Okay, and uh, uh, in principle, the density matrix is a functional of the density, which means that in principle, if you know it's diagonal, you also know the off diagonal elements. But uh, okay, I have shown you a simple example where we actually get the density matrix as a function of a density, but this is a uh, very simplified. So it, it, this reconstruction is often possible in principle, but we are so far from knowing how to do it. Mm. So it happens. So if I understand correctly, and the, the biggest value or the, the prime value of exact results for the exchange collation kernel for you guys would be um, as a benchmark and not as an input or no, 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 it's not true because uh, we guys are not only Green's function guys, okay? <laughs> so we are spectroscopists and we uh, use Green's function to get spectroscopy as we use TDDFT to get spectroscopy, yeah. as we yeah. would use whatsoever you give us to do spectroscopy, okay? And we do a lot of TDDFT. And this is why we did this work uh, with Martin Panholzer that Matteo has also shown. Uh, so this was still another approach, hypernet chain approximation and so on. Okay, so um, for example, having this uh, very good uh, zero temperature momentum and frequency dependent FXC in the gas is for us necessary because we want to, in the connector spirit, take this FXC from the gas and use it in real materials. And we are also working on how you can import this from the gas. So we're absolutely interested in this. Have you guys uh, done this at finite temperature? I mean, I, I know the Panholzer paper and I'm familiar with some. No. Of them. no. Okay. I know that Martin, I mean, he it was uh, ages ago, some years ago, he did send me some results for finite temperature, but unfortunately we didn't follow up on it, but it looked very good what he sent me. So. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's uh, we are a little bit, I mean, we have no, uh, strict reason not to be at finite temperature. Yeah. In general, it's more difficult to be at zero temperature. So you could think that we are masochistic. Of course, we think that our electronic temperature is quite low in our experiments, right? And uh, we are more worried about the temperature of the lattice where we have phonons and so on. This would be sort of more important for us. Um, but in principle, especially when you use Green's functions, right? It's very straightforward to go to, to finite temperature. Um, and I think it's also it would also be interesting, of course, to extend to finer temperature. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. Mm. Um, what about the Matsubara green function? Have you thought about this, or would it be helpful for you to get, let's say, uh, quantum Monte Carlo results, potentially exact quantum Monte Carlo results, let's say, for Matsubara green function of the homogeneous electron gas? Okay. The problem is, I mean, everything new that we can get as a benchmark is interesting. The problem of Matsubara, so if you want to go on the imaginary axis, is that usually functions are very smooth. That is why people go on the imaginary axis. And uh, this is very successful when you want to integrate, for example, get a total energy, because then you don't want to have all these details around, okay? It's integrated out. But if you want to get a spectrum, um, we don't like to stay on the imaginary axis because since the things are so smooth, it's very difficult to get back to the real axis. I, I, mean, so, I, understand, I understand this very well. I mean, this analytic continuation thing, uh, talking about masochism, uh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, what, it's what we are suffering from. Um, would it be, I mean, this is a, maybe a bit of a wild idea, but it's very helpful in the context of warm matter. matter. Um, have you thought about um, translating an experimental measurement that you do in frequency space um, onto the imaginary axis? Which you can do right because this direction is easy only the other direction is hard mm -hmm. okay i mean sometimes we transform experimental measurements not on the imaginary axis but in some other way for example doing yeah. thomas transformation or so uh, you often have the problem that uh, 
your experimental data are not precise enough or you don't have enough uh, frequencies. Yeah. So it's not straightforward. It is very difficult to have experimental results that you can safely transform in some way. This is the experience. Okay. And um, OK, we are uh, OK. So we, we have two legs, if you want. We work with uh, experimentalists directly who do spectroscopy and who like to be on the real axis and uh, synchrotrons or electron microscope or so. And the other thing is that we are method developers. And this means that we like to find problems that yeah. we then can solve, OK? Yeah. And, and so we like to see problems. And on the imaginary axis, one has a tendency to hide the problem because everything is so smooth, right? So that's another reason why we really want to compare things on the real axis. OK. Mm. But of course, you can convince me. <laughs> that, no, no, I mean, we are, we are open to do everything, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, but the thing is, um, okay, I mean, as, as you say, um, but with Quantum Monte Carlo, I mean, you're kind of uh, limited to the imaginary axis. If you want to do Quantum Monte Carlo in real frequency space, it's like horrible because you then get this oscillating phase vector, and it's not only a sign problem, right? It's like a phase problem, which is um, mm -hmm. sometimes even worse. So this is uh, basically not possible. But um, I don't know. So this is one of the directions that we are now. Uh, yeah, kind of exploring what kind of information we can extract from the imaginary axis um, mm -hmm. and out an analytic continuation and so on. So one idea that we had was to transform the, the experimental measurement to the imaginary axis. And this works well in some cases, as you says, um, say, say, and then it depends on the measurement. So you need the entire frequency range so that you can do this transformation. But in some cases, at least for one lens matter, it's possible. And then the other idea is um, there are some other relations. So if you are interested in a dynamic structure factor and then the imaginary uh, time correlation function, it would be an imaginary time density density correlation function, right? The connection between those two is a two-sided Laplace transform. And this has a number of well-known mathematical properties. For example, it's directly related to the moment generating function you might know from uh, probability theory from math. And then you can also get the frequency moment of the dynamic structure factor directly from working. Sure. Um, and I'm... And this should, in principle, also work for the mass of our mean function and the single particle spectral function, now that I think of it. So what would be possible then would be to compare the frequency moments of the single particle spectral function. Yeah, frequency moments are an important thing. Yeah. I mean, we had a discussion. I was in a meeting last week. We had a discussion about uh, how much we can get if we have so and so many frequency moments. Uh, of our spectral functions yes. and how to use this to reconstruct the uh, properties. Exactly. I mean, so it's the Hamburger problem, right? And it's also something we are very much interested in. Mm. No, no. So, um, yeah, we had actually a discussion of whether it's better to have these frequency moments, uh, other sum rules, or parts of the spectrum. I, I think it depends on the property we look at, but it's certainly in. in in important cases, it would be great to have frequency moments. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because you can get them from the from the curvature or the slope and around the origin of your imaginary. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Mm. Um, before I ask more specific questions about the excitonic uh, part, so other questions from the audience. Tim, we cannot hear you. Tim, we cannot hear you. No. Tim will ask in a minute. Um, any other questions in the meantime? Okay, then I start with, or I will have another uh, specific point. Um, have you explored the Kokon and Oberhauser potential? Or are you familiar with this uh, line of work? Yeah, Matteo? Yes, we are familiar with it. And the answer is no. And the reason is that in uh, the, the diagrammatic approach, uh, the exact self-energy is GW times a vertex. So there is just a single vertex. Um, it means that if we take the uh, the other approach, uh, the Kukonen over other, we would have two vertices yeah. instead of one. So this is not an ingredient that we usually use. Then the question is what we, um, so you already see that we, the, the, the question becomes 
why we want to define an effective uh, uh, interaction. What is the purpose of this effective interaction? For us, it's an ingredient that is entering this diagrammatic approach. So everything should be under control to avoid double counting. In their case, it was an effective potential for uh, two interacting electrons in a medium. Yeah. So I think that the purpose would be different in the two cases. In our case, this test charge, test electron uh, potential just comes from this diagrammatic approach, from these vertex, vertex corrections, making a local approximation to uh, the functional derivative of the self energy, so to the vertex. Yeah, so the reason why I'm asking and the reason why I like Hopun and Oberhauser is, um, as you said, it has a very clear physical interpretation. And I think um, the same physical effect, which is causing what you call excitonic mode, it also manifests uh, straightforwardly in the Hopun and Oberhauser potential. Because if you write it down, right, you see that you get this extra yeah. term. Mm. There, are, there are links, indeed. Yeah. And then you see, right, and that uh, low density and the Hopun and Oberhauser potential also has this um, attractive minimum. Um, mm -hmm. precisely at the pair distance, right? And, and it's clear where it comes from. It comes because the medium in some sense is pushing a pair of electrons um, closely together because some uh, spatial order yeah, it will either minimize the energy in the ground state or the free energy at final temperature. Um, so I think it's it's the same, uh, the same physical origin. Yeah, there are indeed links because, uh, as I said, the test charge test electron interaction is one vertex. Yeah. The Kukonen over Hauser has two vertices. Yeah. But if we use the same local approximation for the vertex, this is the same. The yeah. same, I mean, the same correction, just applied differently. Yeah. Mm. Maybe if I can add something, sure. I think we are touching an important point here is that every time you make an effective quantity, like an effective interaction, mm. this is tuned for a certain purpose, right? As Matteo said. And so, um, if we are a little bit hand waving, it sounds very intuitive, but then we have to say, where do we use this now and how do we use it? And for example, uh, if you use it in a self energy as a screened interaction in a self energy, you risk to get double counting because the self energy itself is already expressing an exchange correlation effect, right? And so this is, to my opinion, where we only have one vertex mm -hmm. in our many body perturbation theory. And so if we want to use an effective potential to express our self energy, we naturally get a test charge test electron uh, screening and not a test electron test electron. This makes sense. So I, I also wouldn't know of an application of Coco and Oberhauser, to be honest. So I just like it, and like is maybe also overstatement, but I find it useful just uh, to illustrate the physics uh, going on in the system. Um, Tim, we still cannot hear you. <laughs> Maybe you can write your question in the chat, or is it a long one? Meanwhile, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. That's very good. So, Tim, I am hijacking your order. So, I have uh, two questions. The one is very technical. I am just very curious uh, how you did the calc like from technical point of view, right? How you did the calculations of this uh, TDF. Alda for across for different wave numbers. So did you use some uh, your package or did you write your own code or did uh, or since it's electron gas, did you just use the Linhart function? Maybe I can answer on this. So you're referring to the calculation for uh, the emotion electron gas for the response function, right? Yeah, 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 you showed this. Yeah, the spectrum, okay. right? For, for, exam for example, the static screening or the uh, dynamic structure factor. Right. For example, dynamic structure factor, let's yeah. say at, at large wave numbers where you see yes. so called epsilon. Yeah. So, uh, Jaco Koskelo wrote a, a code that is uh, mm, benefiting from the cylindrical symmetry of the problem. So it's uh, any in-house code that has been developed on purpose to uh, calculate uh, the gas. So this is the technical answer. In and practice, want... yes. So for the concerning the ALDA, what the code is doing is simply solving the Dyson equation of TDFT 
where you start from chi zero, that is the Lindar function, and then you correct it with uh, the exchange correction uh, kernel, for which you make an approximation. In the case of the ALDA, the approximation is that this kernel is just a number in the gas. Yeah, okay. And, uh, and, uh, is no, I, is not from Quantum Monte Carlo. I, uh, I'm curious because uh, you also showed some real materials, right? And uh, it seems that you guys want to investigate real materials. And for that case, what, what you're going to use as a, uh, I'm sorry. As, uh, you for, mean for real materials? Yeah. I, I, I missed the point. You, uh, so in, in the case of real materials, the TDLDA, the adiabatic local density approximation, is an approximation in the uh, terminology of the connector. It means that you take the uh, adiabatic local density approximation kernel of the gas, and you use as uh, the connector the local density. You are making an approximation that is local in space and time. I'm, I'm very sorry, can I interrupt you? Uh, I, sure. I think, uh, I think that uh, I did express my question more clearly, right? Okay. So the uh, your uh, time dependent ALDA calculations for electron gas are clear, right? Yes. And uh, I mean, for uniform electron gas, in principle, you can use just Linkhart, right? Because Explain yeah, but this time. this wouldn't be the Linder function is not the adiabatic local density approximation result. You agree? No, no, no I agree, right? Hmm? Yes, but okay. uh, you, you just correct it, right? You you correct it. Yes, exactly. You saw the dozen equation of TDFT in the gas. Yeah. In a real material, you do the same. And now, if your question is, what is the equivalent of the Linder function? In the real material? No, no, no. I'm not. I'm just my question. My question very really technical. The first question is, uh, how you would do it for large wave numbers for real materials? Because for uniform electron gas, it's kind of simple, but mm -hmm. for, for for real material, you have to actually perform the linear response TDDFT calculations, right? Yes. And which uh, for large wave numbers, uh, it's is... costly. It's costly usually, right? If yes. You use... So and, uh, I I wonder if you have found solution for that. Okay, so the equation to solve is exactly the same. It's always the time dependent uh, density functional equation uh, in linear response that is this Dyson equation, always the same. The difference are the ingredients in the gas. Chi zero is knowing, known analytically, it's a linear function. And the technical problem is that um, you cannot simply sample as you would do in an initial calculation, the brilliant zone with the Moncon Spark uh, grid uh, because it's too costly. So we had to write a, a code that is specifically take into account the cylindrical symmetry of the gas. In a real material, in a crystal, we have other codes that we have developed in our group that are based on uh, um, standard VFT codes like uh, Abinit or Quantum Espresso that are using a plane wave basis to uh, represent the Consham orbitals. With this, we can calculate the uh, Consham independent particle response function chi zero, which is expressed in the uh, frequency and reciprocal space. It's a, a matrix in the reciprocal lattice vectors, G and G prime. It's a function uh, of the um, wave vector in the first brilliant zone and a function of frequency. And then we solve the Dyson equation in this space. Then you're right, it's costly because we have to uh, include uh, uh, many K points. We have to sample the brilliant zone with many K points. And we have to take into account all the possible transitions from uh, valence to conduction states. So we have to do a numerical convergence, but this is doable, we do it. And for, for that, so you use your own code? Yes. Okay, okay, that was what I wanted to know, actually, right? Okay, <laughs> so if you want to know the, the, the name of the code, it's called DP, and it's yeah, yeah. Is interface. It, is it open, yeah. open access? It's open access, but you can find in uh, on the web many different uh, open access TDDFT codes. So this is done uh, routinely. Yeah, yeah, okay. I mean, I, I just wondered does it, if it's uh, if it's handles this vertical uh, yeah. problems more efficiently compared to, uh, for example, GPO. 
it would be the, the analogous case. But you cannot use these codes to uh, calculate straightforwardly the homogeneous electron gas because they are uh, optimized, they are thought with having in mind crystals. Okay. 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 The homogeneous electron gas has a different kind of symmetry that is not exploited by these codes. Okay, so uh, I have one more question, right? For real materials, if you want to investigate uh, this exciton and all of this stuff, uh, mm -hmm. would it be for you useful to have exchange correlation kernel, which is, let's say, hybrid level or meta GGA level? Okay, so um, you the question is how to do calculation for excitons using TDFT. No, 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 no. I'm just uh, my question is the following. So mm -hmm. they're using Alda, right? And I know for extended yes. si for extended systems, it's problematic to, to compute anything beyond GGA for exchange correlation kernel. Yeah, the problem is not computational. Is the fact that you obtain uh, results that are not um, in agreement with the experiment because they don't uh, describe accurately excitonic effects in solids in extended systems. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, no, okay. My question is the following uh, So, there is the exchange correlation function. Well, 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 beyond, well, well beyond LDA, right? Let's say we, we can take the hybrid functional, yes. PTSD, right? Or PBE0, right? Which is the yeah. one actually mm -hmm. most correctly described to your system, and uh, for example, yes. right? And uh, if you have exchange correlation for that, kernel, exchange correlation kernel for that functional, yeah. would it be for you? more useful than so, yes. LDA. Mm -hmm. The point I was about to make is the fact that the ALDA is an approximation to the exchange correlation kernel of TDFT, which is a function of two points in space and two points in time, because it's a functional derivative of the local exchange correlation potential of Consham. If you go to the hybrid uh, functional framework, you have a potential that becomes non-local in space, okay? When you then take the functional derivative of this non-local potential, you get the kernel that is like the kernel of the beta salpeter equation. It becomes four point. So you are no more in the strict sense in the realm of TDFT. You are now in sort of making an approximation, a rough approximation to the self-energy and a rough approximation to the kernel of the beta salpeter equation. Or if you want, you are making an efficient beta salpeter uh, calculation. That's very interesting, right? That's mm -hmm. very interesting. So why I am bringing it up because uh, recently we developed a method to compute the exchange correlation kernel for mm -hmm. any exchange correlation functional, like okay. the two point, like uh, for for, yeah. for, for exact it, which, which it, exactly it's... can be used for exciton or plasmon stuff, right? Yeah. It's uh, my point is that it's not enough to say a functional. You have also to specify the form of the potential and the form of the kernel because they are not the same i mean you can have the ex in principle exact tdft kernel that would be a two point in space and two point in two point in time and you can have the exact kernel of the beta salpeter equation that would be four point kernel in principle both of them give spectra but they are not the same so, okay, okay. Right. Is, is this clear? I mean, uh, I I think we a bit kind of uh, uh, missing each other a bit, but that, that, that's okay, mm -hmm. that's okay. Now, now uh, thank you for your answer, right? Now I more okay. understand, more, it's because it's just different perspective, right? To the same thing, essentially. So, uh, because, because what I'm thinking about is uh, the dynamical structure factor, for example, for real material, right? Which is yes. on, right? Which you use the on. Eventually, what you use, is more or less macroscopic response function. Yes, my point and, is, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, if you eventually use the macroscopic response function, then for example, if you take the, then you can get spectrum for that. So, and all of these two comp, uh, two 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 position or four position kernels, right? All, all of these things are internal. Now we are missing you. Sorry. Uh, all of all of this uh, two three point or four point stuff are mm -hmm. internal mechanisms, right? And yeah, but it means that they are different objects. So when okay, you are referring yeah, yeah. to different objects, you have to be careful. But in, in general, it's true that you can obtain this, in principle, the same result, the same spectra 
even using very different methods. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And it's interesting because you can make connections between the different approaches, and you take you can take the best of the different words. Mm. So, but uh, okay, okay, but uh, eventually we can agree on the following point: is that uh, what you need for your calculations is macroscopic response function. For example, if you are okay. interested in the macroscopic response function, yes. Uh, I mean, if your exciton, for example, can be yes. obtained from the macroscopic response function, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks to you. Maybe we can go ahead with the question by Tim. <laughs> Yeah, shall I shall I read it or? Can you hear me now? Oh, oh no, we can oh, hear yeah. you. Again. <laughs> Finally, uh, okay. Well, I, I, yeah, I'll read it. Uh, like I was curious, the very last thing you mentioned about getting the uh, density directly from the potential. Like, is it, is it some kind of approximation, and you have to, you know, rely yeah. on your system fulfilling certain conditions or? I think if you allow me to show a couple of slides, Mohammed will be very happy. If you allow me to <laughs> I, I have no slides. problem, yeah. Yeah. Okay, let, let me try to, to share again. Uh -huh. Let's see. Uh, can you see my slide? Yeah. Okay, fine. So the, 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 the aim was really to get uh, the density as a functional of the potential. And uh, this is in the connector framework, okay? So we want to get the density from a model system and use it in place of the density of the real system. And the real system that uh, Mohammed has looked at is a cubic helium, which is very inhomogeneous, so very different from the model system. You have seen earlier that uh, the homogeneous electron gas has a hard time to simulate helium. And we always look for the worst case because we want to solve problems, as I said. So you have the atoms around zero and 30, and this is the density. And then we need an approximate connector. So this already answers your question. It's an approximate formula, which Mohammed is developing right now in collaboration with Vitali Borolov. And uh, he's trying to make better and better approximations. And um, he is starting from the fact that we know, uh, if you look here on the left side, we know the density in the homogeneous electron gas as a function of the potential, setting the chemical potential to zero. This is the density given the potential, so the potential respect to the chemical potential tells you how many electrons you have, so what density you have, okay? And if you did now the equivalent to the LDA, which is the roughest approximation, we would call it a local potential approximation. You would take this very same formula and you would just replace for the density in a given point, you would take the, the potential in the same point. So this would be our local potential approximation completely nearsighted, and then you get the red curve, and you see that it's actually astonishingly good, but it's not very good on the atoms, and it has this strange little kinks here, right? So it is not satisfactory, but it sort of already shows that your material has something to do with your very rough formula. And now we are looking for a connector uh, potential, which is so better than this local potential, some, some kind of average potential. And what Mohammed did, uh, amongst other things, is to say, uh, we again, uh, we, we, we use a linear response framework. So a linear response approximation would give us uh, the potential if we perturb the homogeneous electron gas by using our external potential. And we use this as a connector approximation. And then you get this kind of equation. So our density is taken from the gas with the connector potential and the connector potential is approximated in linear response. So it comes out that it's a sort of average around the point R but the average is given by the Lindhardt function. So this is the Lindhardt function in the gas where we expand around some potential. And, um, and that's the result, so which is called connector theory. It's green and you can see that it's really a big improvement with respect to this nearsightedness. So you are much closer on the atoms and you get rid of all these uh, nasty kinks here. So uh, this is a result which is our starting point to go further and Mohammed. Uh, is about to go further, for example, by using exact constraints. And uh, uh, as you can see, uh, this is a very, very uh, simple expression. And so we are confident that we can get uh, good estimates of densities with really, really minor effort in this way. Thanks. Yeah, it's really interesting. And do you think that could have some implications outside connector theory? Like if I was just doing a general 
DFT calculation, could I maybe speed through the first part of the FCF cycle? Exactly, that's And then yes, just yes. at the end, correct it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, we introduced this connector theory uh, thing with Matteo, not because we want to have a new theory, but because we are very pragmatic people. And mm -hmm. uh, we think that we should compute less. Okay, this is really our baseline. We should compute less. And if we compute something, we should share it. And someone else should reuse it. So we are in the beginning and we are trying to use everything from the homogeneous electron gas that you might ever invent and speed up our real calculations. And it's exactly as you say, we're hoping that we can get this as a preconditioner to get to the conchamp cycle and also in the conchamp cycle to avoid the diagonalization or equivalent approaches in the conchamp cycle. And also if you have a new material, you would just get, would like to get a first idea of the density. Why don't you just estimate like that, you know? What happens at the interface also so we have these applications in mind hmm. yeah cool it's very interesting thanks i don't know mohammed would you want to add something no thank you no, you were very so good <laughs> our hero who did the did the work and any more questions from the audience I mean, you have already been extremely generous with your time but i would have one more question regarding the uh, exitonic mode if i may and this of the following, um, or it's, it's probably a Pandora's box of questions, um, you know, that you have foolishly agreed. Um, how do I start this? Um, so, okay, so you, um, you, you said and you explained and that you view it as a, I don't know if new is the correct word, but as a collective mode, which is uh, different from the plasmon. And I think we agree it's different from the plasmon. We kind of understand what the plasmon is, right? It's what you get in a charged system and the limit of small q. It's a collective excitation. And uh, so my way of understanding uh, these things like the dynamic structure factor, for example, you can express it in a spectral representation where the dynamic structure factor is just given by a sum over different transitions between the n electron uh, eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. And in the plasmon, right, it changes where between the different eigenstates, basically all particles in the system are changed. And it kind of intuitively also makes sense because small q, right, means the wavelength is very long. So when the wavelength is macroscopic, it makes sense uh, that the entire system is changed. When we are now going to the uh, excitonic mode, um, so uh, my understanding, and I'm just very curious how this, uh, can can be uh, coherent uh, with, with your exotonic interpretation. So my understanding is that it occurs in a regime where the wavelength associated with the Q, so it's roughly at two times the Fermi wave number, where the wavelength is uh, roughly comparable uh, to the average electron-electron distance in the system. And um, as you also explained, um, when you use the kernel by Martin Panholzer, right from the 2018 PRL, um, this uh, two particle, two hole kernel, um, you already get uh, this exitonic mode. Why call it collective mode and not uh, a two body effect? So, I, in my mind, it's, uh, it's an electron electron effect and not a collective effect. I'm sorry if it's a heretical question. I'm just uh, genuinely curious. Maybe I can answer. Huh? Oh, at least I can start. So yes, I agree with all you say in the sense that we have just the response function chi and we have the poles of chi and these poles of chi are charge excitations. Okay, this is the general feature of um, the excitations that are uh, the poles of chi. And then uh, we um, can think about labels and names of these different features. And uh, then these names are given by from historical for historical reasons. In particular, we have plasmons that have been identified already in the 60s. And uh, this uh, excitonic collective mode that has been put forward by Takada recently. But both of them have the same nature, being poles of this response function chi, which also means that they can be measured. So from this point of view, they are the same thing. And uh, there is no strict separation between the two. If you look at the spectrum, uh, they are uh, poles. You cannot distinguish them. If you make an experiment, you just see peaks and you cannot distinguish them. From uh, uh, the point of view of the definition of what we call a collective mode, again, this is historical. It's due to the fact that historically, 
we define collective modes as uh, the zeros of the real part of epsilon to distinguish them from the peaks in the imaginary part of epsilon that are more related to interband transitions, so electronal excitations. But again, this is historical, and also the distinction between the two in real materials can be not so uh, strict. Okay, again, it's a, a definition. And then, if, if then, I add something, I'm very sorry, <clears throat> but mm -hmm. I think the distinction also breaks down at finite temperature, so it also becomes more yeah. muddled. And yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Then, what? Where is the distinction between the two? If there is a distinction. And I think that the distinction is due to the fact that if you use the random phase approximation to calculate the excitation spectrum of the gas, or in general of chi, you can have only this plasmon feature. And this plasmon feature, indeed, as the or its origin is in the long range uh, part of the Coulomb interaction. You cannot have this excitonic collective mode, as Takada calls it because this um, plasmon is due to the Coulomb repulsion. You can have instead this additional mode in this regime of low density, if you go beyond the random phase approximation, and in the jargon of midi-body perturbation theory, it means that you take into account the electronal interaction, the electronal attraction, and that's why we call it, uh, we say that it has an excitonic character. Now, the important message of our uh, work, I think, is that it's not enough to say that this has an excitonic origin. We have also to specify that this um, electron in interaction calculated at the random phase approximation level is not enough. It's too much screened. And the reason why we have this overscreening is the fact that we have to take into account this, uh, what we call self-polarization correction that makes the interaction between the electron and the hole strong at short distances. Why short distances are important in the gas? Because at long distances, the electronal attraction is completely dumped. We know that there is a perfect screening. In order to have excitonic interactions in a metal, in a gas, we need to have a strong electronal uh, attraction at short distances, and most probably also at short times. So this is, for us, the, the the key. Okay, so um, again, I, I have to apologize in advance for my follow up question. But um, um, what you say, what you say makes sense. So I, I kind of understand it. And the the physical origin, how you get your electron hole um, attraction, and what makes it stable, also that it's long. Uh, short, sorry, that it's a uh, short uh, distance. Um, for me. Um, or my interpretation or my way of, of looking at it would be it comes from the exchange correlation kernel. And, and I think you would agree. That yes. The correlation kernel is also directly connected to your, to your vertex corrections and so on. So it's, it's basically the same object. Yes, uh, I, I confirm because the random phase approximation can be expressed both in TDFT and in the beta Peter equation framework by completely neglecting the exchange correlation kernel in one side and the electronal attraction on the other side. So they are exactly analogous. Yes. Yeah, so my, my heretical follow-up question is the following. Because in my uh, quantum Monte Carlo calculations, I don't have any holes. I just have the electrons. And then the effect of the exchange correlation kernel is that the um, electrons will actually be attractive to each other, right? Due to the surrounding medium, which kind of pushes uh, them together. So my question is, why call it excitonic excitation for which you need an, an electron and a hole which attract each other when it could just be an electron-electron mm -hmm. pair? Yes. Uh, yeah, this is uh, a very interesting question, and I think it's more general than just this, uh, this case. It applies to any response function that we calculate either in TDFT or in the beta peter equation. In principle, as we said many times in, uh, in this discussion, with both approaches, we would get the exact absorption spectrum, the exact response function. But then the interpretation could be different in the two cases. In the case of uh, um, many body perturbation theory, it's natural to call, for example, an exciton, a peak that you have in absorption spectrum that has an energy that is smaller than the photomission gap. And the difference between the photomission gap and the um, peak in the absorption is called the binding energy of the exciton. If you do now the same calculation using the exact TDFT, 
you would obtain the same spectrum, but the interpretation would be different because as you said, in the case of TDFT, we don't have particles moving around. You have just the induced density, the density that has been excited, and we calculate just the variation of the density for an external potential. And in this case, you, we don't have even the reference of the photomission gap. So we wouldn't be able to define a bonding energy of an exciton. So in this framework, we don't have excitons. We don't have the electron attraction. Indeed, the exchange correlation kernel of TDFT has to play two roles that are played in the framework of many body perturbation theory by the self energy that is opening the gaps with respect to consham and uh, this electron hole attraction that is reducing the gaps with respect to photoemission. In FXC, in the kernel of TDFT, these two roles are played by the kernel itself. So in principle, it's not possible to distinguish these two, two effects. And in this, indeed, this is the problem that we have in TDFT in general of the interpretation of the results. We don't, we cannot use the terminology of particles that are moving around, that are interacting with effective interactions, because in TDFT, formally, we don't have effective particles. This is rather the language of many body perturbation theory. Then I call this a problem, but you could also say that this is an advantage because in the framework of many body perturbation theory, we have to do a two-step calculation. In TDFT, we don't have to do it. So TDFT is more efficient. So what you can prefer could be different according to what is your question, I would say. And again, this is very general. I think I think um, to say it in my own words, I think we agree on the on the basic uh, physical mechanism that is happening in the system, and then it's uh, more a uh, yeah a matter of terminology or a matter of perspective how we would look at it, and then you can interpret it as exciton or not exciton, but in principle and the physics is the same. Yeah, nice. it's yeah, it's possible. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I can add on this just in case there are DMFT people here. I mean, dynamical mean field theory. We have we the same problem with dynamical mean field theory because we, we can calculate the same things, but we would not interpret it in the same way yeah. because the way we write down the problem, even if even though we should get the same result at the end, uh, guides your interpretation. So dynamical mean field theory has a much more atomic uh, interpretation, right? They, yeah. they, they would not talk about the plasmons and we would say we have localized plasmons. So that, that's a general uh, problem when we talk to each other, right? Absolutely, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. And yeah, another example is uh, if if you want to calculate DD excitations that are uh, or multiplets that are atomic excitations that you can measure in different uh, with different spectroscopies. Typically, you use RICS, resonant elastic ray scattering. These are atomic excitations, and indeed, you can use local clusters, local cluster models to obtain them. So at these. For this, you just need an effective atom. In spirit, it's similar to DMFT. But these excitations are very often uh, inside the gap. And these, in our language, would be called Frankel excitons or very uh, tightly bound excitons. But again, they would be the same thing, just seen from different uh, starting points. Would actually be very interesting to sit together and make the direct link between these different uh, things because this is also very helpful to design new approximations, right? Yeah. Okay. Any more questions from the audience? Doesn't seem to be the case, but we're already uh, approaching uh, two hours rather quickly. So thanks again very much uh, for your talks and for the very interesting discussion. So you have been very generous. Uh, yeah, thank you. It was awesome. Thanks to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, it, it was a pleasure. I, I guess you will have to pay it back. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Uh, I will happily do so. so really? Yeah, we should organize that, right? Oh, it would be really nice to discuss a little more, I think. <laughs>